So, John Marks, welcome to the Holsey Style. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I don't know how exactly I encountered your page and exactly when, but I'm pretty sure it was probably at the beginning of the pandemic. And I was just really struck by your Instagram page in particular. I loved how it had an eclectic, I would say, mix of material. You had a good combination of your own outfits and also your uh, things that you found inspirational, such as, you know, the way that people dress, and then you had your own travel pictures. And so I just really liked the way you put your Instagram together. And I thought, hmm, I got to get to know this guy. And I think one of us followed each other. And uh, here we are. <laughs> We've been reacting since. Yeah, exactly. Been liking each other's posts since, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where are you uh, hailing from, so to speak? New York City in Manhattan. New York, New York. So New how York. did you uh, end up in New York? Ah, uh, man, it's a long story. Um, we could go back to me being a kid watching movies like, uh, I don't know, like Mean Streets um, and Goodfellas and a lot of Scorsese movies. And that incepted the idea in my head as a little kid that I wanted to live in New York City. And so, you know, things kind of just. Um, so I went to acting school, met my wife in acting school and she's from New York city. So once we, you know, we started dating and got serious and I started thinking about popping the question and then I did, she said, yes. And then boom, it brought me to New York city in 2016. So, you know, it's kind of a story of the, the idea happening as a kid. And then my life just unfolded in a way that showed an opportunity and I met, you know, my soulmate and it all worked out. So, going to acting school was the primary motivation for you moving to New York? Um, when I was in acting school, you know, I went to acting school because I wanted to make movies eventually. And I felt like a good director or filmmaker should be, you know, they should be able to speak the actor's language. Um, and it was a, a very fun way to, to learn those skills and to learn how to collaborate with other creative folks. Um, so I think when I was in acting school, I probably wanted to go to Los Angeles and do the, you know, the Hollywood route until I, you know, reached my senior year and realized that the Hollywood dream is kind of, it's kind of dead. You know, like you don't really need to go to Los Angeles in order to like be in movies or make movies. Um, and New York City just seemed like a much more fun place to live. Um, yeah, so that um, I kind of changed my trajectory and wanted to go to New York. Hmm. That seems an inconventional route. Did you know going in that you eventually wanted to be a director? Um, no, not really. I mean, I made movies as a kid. Like I always had the camcorder and I was making films or getting the neighborhood kids together and we would make movies. Um, so it was always like a part of my life. And I grew up watching movies and just consumed by them. I think at one point, like my whole personality was formed from films, which, you know, it's not the best thing, but. <laughs> Depends uh, on the films, I suppose. Yeah, maybe. Um, so it's always just been like a natural drive for me or like an obsession. And then, um, you know, I studied biology too. And at one point I wanted to go into medicine. And then I reached this crossroads where I was, you know, I could either continue and go into medicine or I could go into acting and try and go that route. And I chose the acting route. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know that it was ever like, I had this concrete idea that I wanted to be a director or a filmmaker, but I always just went, I chose that path for some reason. Hmm. And then fast forward to, you know, I graduated acting school and moved to New York City, and I've been working in education for the past five years. And I think one thing ed working in education does is it really shows you um, how easy it is to give up on your dreams and how sad that is. And like my time in education has been this, this period of learning a lot and learning that life is too short to give up on your dreams if that makes any sense. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's very interesting that you put it that way. How, how did education teach you that it's very easy to give up on your dreams? It's, a, well, you know, it's a really demanding. Um, it's such a demanding field and it requires so much patience and, you know, love for learning and love for, for kids and students um, that it takes a lot out of you. So you reach those points where you're totally drained and you're, you're looking for the things that fill you back up, you know? So it's, it's kind of like it, it, it takes these seasons in life where you give everything and you are totally empty for you to be able to look at yourself and, and remember, okay, these were the things that filled me up. Like this was my original passion, or these are the things that I wanted to do. Hmm. Can you relate to that at all being in education the and a writer? I believe so. I think that it might be a little bit different for you and I, depending on how you're going to answer the next question. So mm -hmm. what grade do you, do you teach? Or you said you're a director. So what, what grades are you overseeing? Middle school through high school. Okay. That'll do it to you. <laughs> that's yeah, that'll do it to you. I think oh. that's the issue right there. See, I teach, <clears throat> I teach English at two colleges. Right. So the amount of time that I spend on a physical campus with students, at least before the pandemic, because of course, you know, but I probably spent at most a week, including office hours, 10 hours. Okay. Tops. So I'm not physically on a location at, you know, for eight hours a day and having to deal with students, it's not as demanding. And I'm very happy that I made that choice because I think I would have been much like perhaps you, where I would have kind of over emptied myself, so to speak, yeah. um, because I don't spend so much time with students because I have so much free time, I mean, free time, because yeah. what you don't do on the actual job site, you have to do at home, but still, I don't have to deal with people all the time. So it's not as demanding for me. So I think that we're in a little bit different situations there and that I have a lot more free time than perhaps you do. Nonetheless, I've had it before where, you know, I'm, I'm teaching five classes and the amount of free time I have is so little that I just feel so overwhelmed. And I think I came to a point much like you, or just like, I can't do, I don't have enough energy to do the things that I'm actually really, really passionate about even if I wanted to read, even if I have the time to read, my mind is so burdened by what I've been doing, grading, yeah, yeah. working with students, et cetera, yeah. speaking that I can't really give myself fully to it. So I think it's a consequence of not having that leisure time, I would say. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That, makes sense. And that doesn't seem to be like, obviously it's not a, it's not something unique to education right? Like it's such a, absolutely like, it's such a cliche that, you know, the nine to five really makes you, it really tests you and, you know, makes you see what your, um, what your passions are, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know, there's something unique about education to where you're, um, you're facilitating learning and you're watching these students have these moments of discovery and it's amazing. And then you zoom out like on a, you know, a Friday evening and you're like, man, I used to have those moments of discovery too. And I used to like be very um, engaged and enthused and excited about learning something new that doesn't have to stop once you leave school. Right. All right. Yeah. So that's kind of been like my, my epiphany or my experience in the past like five years in education land. Mm, education land. <laughs> so I want to explore a little bit for a moment, the relationship between acting and dressing, because part of acting, I assume, is dressing up, right? putting on costumes when you're playing a character. Mm -hmm. And I find this relationship fascinating, especially after having a conversation. I don't know if you watched my conversation with uh, Demetrios Levy, I believe his name is. So another YouTuber. But he went to film school and right. I was very fascinated by the way he explored the relationship between like wearing a costume and actually becoming somebody who is 
sartorially inclined. So mm. maybe I should just begin with the basic question. Do you think that there is a relationship between your experience in acting, dressing up in a costume and your sartorial passion? hundred percent. Yeah. I think that the clothes are the first, um, they're the first choice that you make as a character, right? If you're, if you're playing a role, like the first thing to help you shift your, your thinking or shift your, um, you want to open the door to try to become that person or that role. Clothes are the first thing that you choose. Why is that? Uh, it's, I mean, aside from the obvious of like, you know, our first impressions are made by how we present ourselves and what we're in and blah, 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 blah. It's, it's the first, um, how do I say it? Like kinetically or sensorily, it's the first like physical adoption of that, that role. You know, you can do a lot of like cerebral work or like character development. And all of it is, you know, it's in your mind, it's abstract, but your costume or your clothes are the first things that you touch. So it's the first piece of reality of feeling like, you know, you have put on that role or like you've crossed over that barrier between, okay, it's no longer just a, like an abstract concept. Like now there's a physical component that you can pair with it. Hmm. Are there other so reasons? Uh, probably. I think they're probably different for every actor or performer too. For me, it was like, I always had to feel, um, I always had to like put on the shoes and feel the kind of clothes that they would wear. And that would kind of help me like anchor myself in that role. Yeah. Can you give an, a, an example and like uh, an example of a character and the type of clothes you had to wear? Yeah. Uh, we, in college, I did a, a show called Anna in the Tropics. It's a, it's like a fifties um, drama about a cigar factory in, um, in Tampa, Florida, back when Ybor city was made of, uh, you know, cigar factories where they still hand rolled um, cigars. And I played a character named Cheche and, you know, distinctly that show you're in like tropical weather, you're in South Florida. So it's hot, it's humid. Um, you know, the era is mid-century style. So it's all linen, um, kind of, it, it really isn't too far off from what I wear now. It's like linen, high-waisted trousers, wife beater underneath and like a linen sport coat and, you know, like a straw hat. What did that outfit communicate about this particular character? Um, well, uh, the outfit itself, I mean, obviously, like it communicated the time and the era, um, culturally, what that character belonged to. So it gave you all of the context. But then, you know, the other things that you communicate as an actor come from your, like your character work, your, you know, your prep work, your motivations, your, your verbs and that kind of stuff. So the clothes, the clothes can be the first line of communication for who that character is, basically. Yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm kind of driving at here is not only is it a way for you to like set the character in a place and time, but it also seems to be a reflection of further aspects of the character, right? So let's just say, for example, we have character A and character B. Character A wears the same Oxford button-down shirt, let's just say you know, it's a white Oxford button down shirt, that character wears it and has it buttoned up to the top, has, uh, has it tucked into a pair of high waisted trousers. And yet another character wears the same shirt with the same trousers, but they have it like untucked. Like it seemed to me like there would be all these like little intricacies, intricacies and subtleties that would reflect the character that go beyond just what it is that they're wearing more so how it is that they are wearing it that reveal these aspects of their psychology so for example whether they're an orderly person or not whether they um, are organized or not do you see what i'm getting at here 100%. do you think do you think that 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 goes into like creating a character 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, look at, um, have you seen Phantom Thread with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis? I have not, although I do love Daniel Day-Lewis. Put that on your list, man, it's great. Um, but you see he's a, um, he's a tailor in uh, mid-century London, post-war, and everything about how he dresses himself communicates who he is, right? He's a very rigid, meticulous, uh creative he has a massive ego and that's all reflected in his his choices of dress too mm. you know and like his he communicates his expertise of his craft through the combinations of fabrics that he wears the proportions that the fabrics lay on his body and yada 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 and exactly what you were describing a second ago yeah so for you in particular uh, how do you understand your relationship between being an actor wearing a costume and becoming somebody who is passionate about menswear? It seems like it would make the transition, if there was a transition, a bit easier in that you're probably more comfortable, comfortable putting on clothes that you don't necessarily recognize as yours. I know that yeah. when I first started getting involved in menswear, I almost felt like I was wearing a costume because I'd never had the experience of like actually wearing a costume and the clothes that I was putting on didn't feel like they were mine in some uh, very tactical sense, I suppose. But could you speak on that? Yeah, um, I think that, I think that's all a part of it too is, when you feel like you are wearing a costume, like then you are, right? If you feel like you're not wearing a costume, then you're not. And that's a big distinction. Um, but it seems, it seems when you put it that way, it seems to make it, it seems to simplify the issue. It's like whether you do or you don't. But the reality is, is that you're, you're only so much in control of whether you feel as if you're wearing a costume or not. And a lot of feeling Are like you're not wearing a costume is actually just wearing the clothes out into the world and becoming comfortable with them. I feel like you're in total control whether you feel like you're wearing a costume or not. It's not- It's, it's very it's not, existentialist of you. Yeah, yeah. In the technical sense. <laughs> I think it's not an easy switch to flip off and on right? But that is one thing in life that you can control. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that whether you agree with that or not, you know, whether there's a right or a wrong in that sense, I think you just have to make that decision. Um, like, can you think of an example of something that you wore maybe semi recently that felt like a costume? Yeah, absolutely. So I just recently bought a pair of, well, pairs, I should say. I bought two pairs of Polo Andrew pants, which were a pant that were popular in the 90s, but I also yeah. bought two pairs of their shorts. Now, right. those particular pants, they have a significantly higher rise than I'm used to. Like they probably sit about above an the belly inch. Button. Say it again, sorry. Above the belly button? Yeah, about an inch above the belly button. So it's quite high. And then also they're a bit more wide legged than I'm used to. And they have forward facing pleats, which I usually do not wear, mm -hmm. but they felt very 1930s. Like despite yeah. the fact that they were made in the nineties, they have that same kind of feel very Esquire man-esque, Esquire man-esque. Um, but yeah, when I put those on for the first time, I really loved how they looked. And I was just looking at myself in the mirror wearing them and I enjoyed mm -hmm the proportions but when I wore it out into the world I had to start to consider like how it is that I might be perceived and so okay. I had this idea like I'm almost doing this cosplay kind of thing from the 1930s and 40s now I felt that way but I wore them four or five times since and now that's very quickly gone away now I feel comfortable in the garments but it wasn't as simple as me saying I am not wearing a costume this is not a costume. It just felt that way until I became comfortable enough in it that it didn't. Did you feel that way when you were trying them on by yourself? And then once you went out into the world, then you felt that self-consciousness? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How could I not be self-conscious? 
I'd have to be a sociopath not to be self-conscious. No, no. I mean, like I said, it's, I don't think it's a, like a, a switch that you can flick on and off that quickly, but that is totally like whether you feel that way or not is in your control. I think we're going to, we're going to reach a, <laughs> we're going to reach an impasse here, I believe. Uh, so I just wanted to continue to explore this a little bit more. So trying to understand deeper your relationship between being an actor, wearing a costume and becoming passionate about menswear. So did you have this issue? Did you find yourself being overly self-conscious feeling as if you were wearing a costume when you started getting more involved in menswear or was this just, you just willed yourself not to feel it whatsoever? No, I mean, it's a process, right? No. Um, I always felt that way about things that I, that didn't meet expectations, mm. right? Because we spend so much time on online and on Instagram, looking at all of these cool clothes. And we see all the lookbooks of these like really cool models in these stylized editorial shots. And we were like, yes, that's it. Like, that's the perfect that's the perfect trouser. That's the perfect jacket. And we order it and it gets in and it doesn't meet that expectation. Right. Those were yeah. the moments where I felt like I was wearing a costume when what the ideal that I had in my mind, when I reached, you know, when I, when I got the item, it didn't live up to that ideal. Hmm. I've certainly had that experience because I've been, I have been on more than one occasion convinced implicitly to buy something based on seeing how it looked on somebody else. And so you, you get this idea that you're going to look like that in that when that might look exceptionally well on them, but it doesn't on you. Yeah. And you can't rock it like that other person does. Yeah. It's so subjective, man. Um, but that, that's, I think that that's also part of the, the process of it or part of what makes menswear fun or make style fun is that you recognize something that you like on someone else. But then when you put it on, you know, your uniqueness and your style, it's not going to be the same and it doesn't communicate the same way. Mm. Yeah. But that's it's fun. also, sorry, go ahead. No, that was it. I was just saying how fun it is. Yeah. I've really, as of late started to have a lot of fun playing with different combinations and trying to incorporate things that aren't being typically worn at the moment. Um, I think I just got to a point where I was just so exhausted with the rules. And I think a lot of my motivation and in getting involved in menswear in the first way, first place was to actually just kind of like learn the rules and then dip. Like yeah. I, I never, I never thought I was going to get passionate about clothing and menswear and have so much fun just wearing clothes I just wanted to learn the rules dress well and get out that was going to be it um, yeah. but it turns out that it's not so easy as all that <laughs> yeah. at least not for me it wasn't I, I have too much of a philosophical mind like I want to know why things work the way they do why things this particular garment looks good with this and that one doesn't that's just how my mind works I think yeah I'm similar in that way you know it's not about like it's not about the the shirt, right? It's about wait, why why the shape? Why is it in the form that it is now in twenty twenty two? What what is it trying to recreate? And how did let's say the shirt's modeled off of a pattern from the fifties? Like how did how did that go away for so long and then now come back? I like yeah. that kind of stuff. You have a and this is uh, also apparent on your Instagram, you seem to have a very kind of historical mind. Mm. It's an interesting way to put it. Uh, I just mean broadly that you seem to be someone who's interested in history. Like I've noticed yeah. on some of your pictures, you'll choose to highlight historical figures, sometimes historical figures that aren't uh, necessarily particularly well-dressed. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think the intersection of menswear and history are inseparable, right? When you start to examine clothing and style, like you can't separate history from that. And I feel like that's what, uh, that's what gives like style context is history. And that is the, 
like the meat of it. Otherwise, it would just be, you know, garments and textiles and stuff. It would just be we're wearing whatever everybody else is wearing at this particular moment with no understanding of why it is that we're wearing it. Yeah, because some... that's most people's relationship to dressing, though. Maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Was there a was there a moment in your life when you like when that that difference in your awareness happened? where you weren't just wearing what, you know, what the mall was putting in the, in the window and you like had an awareness of like clothing and where it came from? Um, I have, if I did, it, it would have to be rather late. Like after I already got involved in menswear in the first place, because initially I was trying to just emulate what it is that people were wearing online to begin with. And mm -hmm. with no understanding that there was such a thing as a high rise trouser in the 1930s, yeah. I naively, when I first got involved, I just thought that that's kind of like the thing now in this particular niche of dressing, if that yeah. makes any sense. So totally. I didn't have any historical context for a long time. And then I started to realize as I purchased these garments, like, I don't know why it is necessarily that, and this is where that philosophical mind comes in, why it is that I'm wearing this and how these trousers came to be. You know, so if I just, for example, take a look at like high rise pleated trousers, mm -hmm. I thought that those were just a thing that was being done now. But as I started to question it, I started to realize like, oh, these have been worn for a very long time and they haven't been worn necessarily as far as fit is concerned in the way that they are being worn now. So if I had to put like a figure on it, I would say probably like a year and a half, two years into my being involved in menswear and actually buying garments. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. In addition to being an actor, you have told me on Instagram that you are very interested in directing your own film starring, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, your wife. So could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of what I was saying before about when you, you know, you have those moments in life that are reminders of what you're passionate about, right? And I think recently I had a one of those reminders in a big way about, you know, my love for film. And I think that we live in a, a time right now where anybody can make a movie and it doesn't have to be a box office, you know, success, or it doesn't have to be picked up on all of the indie movie, um, you know, festival circuits. You can make a movie with the technology that we have and it's all pretty decent quality like at no other time in history has filmmaking been just like accessible for the average person so um why why let that go to waste when you have obsessions and passions and you have the tools that you can you know explore and use them and make things with them don't waste it just do it so you know i've been working on a script for a little bit um it's like a character study about vanity which is a, a pretty relevant topic in the men's world too. Um, yeah, so we're putting together this film and we're trying to figure out as we go and learn what we can and make mistakes, but have fun with it. And hopefully by the end of summer, we'll have some kind of finished product of a short film made by a couple of art school kids. And hopefully there are more after that. Hmm. So do you have experience in shooting films before? No, not on a professional level. Um, you know, I've, I've worked mostly in with stage productions. Um, there are some similar uh, connecting points from film to stage, but no, it'll, it'll kind of be a, a ragtag duo and we'll figure it out as we go and try to stay inspired by the films that, you know, made us passionate about the medium and try and learn how they did what they did and, you know, recreate what we can recreate. Yeah. What are you doing as far as like uh, equipment goes? Are you going to be, I don't know how it works. I mean, 
I'm trying to do something similar myself, although probably not on the scale that you're doing it. Uh, but I just plan to use whatever equipment I already had. Are you guys planning on like renting equipment or buying other equipment? I don't know how that it works in the cinematography world. I don't either. Um, <laughs> the only thing- Here we that, go. <laughs> the only thing that we really need to rent are um, some audio equipment, a decent mic, um, and obviously some sort of gimbal steady cam contraption. You know, otherwise I feel like my DSLR and I have some, some decent lenses and I want to try and use as much natural light as I can. Cause I think that that's prettier anyway. Um, it's very, very tricky. I will say I've been trying to create scenes for the thing that I'm working on. And, um, a lot of it relates to time and the transition of time. Oh man. And, uh, yeah, like dealing with the natural light, trying to get the correct shot, what it is that you're looking for when you're just using the sun and you live in an apartment. I don't know. It's really diff It's been yeah, difficult exactly. for me. That's probably been the primary difficulty. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Same light. I feel like light is the most technical and difficult aspect of like filming or even photographing anything. But up until this point, I would say that I didn't recognize how significant or important it is for making a scene what it is. Mm. In terms of uh, like setting or story? Uh, in terms of like mood in particular. Okay. So I've been recently, because because I've started this project, I've been like watching directors who's work I really enjoy and admire, such as, for example, like a lot of David Fincher's work. Oh, and yeah. <clears throat> he has a particular kind of color grade. Mm -hmm. We won't go into the, the technical details of it. I couldn't even articulate them very well if I wanted to, but he mm -hmm. has a particular kind of color grade. And you notice he has this aspect in all of his films and shows. And uh, it really just kind of reflects a general mood. And so trying to figure out not only how to like shoot a small movie, but at the same time, communicate a kind of consistent mood throughout yeah. the thing is very difficult. And light plays a significant role in that. It's, yeah. it's challenging. Yeah, big time, big time. Especially if you have to like film something in the same location on different days and weather is not always the same. Well, <laughs> yeah. I can imagine, particularly there in New York, maybe I have a Hollywood version of the weather there, but it seems like the weather is quite dramatic. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like Florida in a way. It's, it's pretty manic. You know, it's one day, I don't, like this past spring has been very strange. It's either like 40 degrees and overcast or it's 80 and sunny and you don't know each week what you get. It's a little bit more consistent here in California. So we are in spring, but it's essentially summer. So like today, I believe I'd have to check, but I, I'd have to guess it's about 90 degrees and it's pretty much going to be 90 or hotter probably for the next three months. Some days we'll have clouds. I don't know if I'm whining about something that I shouldn't be whining about, but maybe I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> maybe I prefer a little bit more variability in the weather, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> All right. So I want to spend a little bit of time going back to talking about your Instagram. So you have an interesting handle, the American traditional kind of two parts there, the American and the traditional. I don't know if you perceive them as separate, but what made you want to create that particular handle? Hmm. I wanted, this was like during, during COVID lockdowns and during a lot of the, um, like the political fervor of that time. Right. And fervor, was, yes. That's one way to put it. Yeah. There was a <laughs> lot of like nonsense coming from both sides for sure, but like denigrating American culture and American history in a way that was very like reductionist. And that was very- What do you mean by that? Very reductionist. Like, um, like a retrospect on history without any of the context of the time, right? Like I feel like I would, every day I would see some kind of comment 
on uh, like a historical event, but it removed any meaning, right? And it, it brought that past event into the present, uh, like the present context. Can we give an example? Um, I don't have one off the top of my head, but. What about historical figures? Because at that particular time, oh, this cool. is this is what comes to mind for me. I've been working on a, a poem about Thomas Jefferson and the toppling of one of his statues. But it seems like this is something that's being done at this moment in history to our founding fathers, which is that they are castigated for sins, which are certainly sins. They, of course, were not perfect people. They were flawed human beings. They were men of their time. Mm -hmm. But when you say reductionist, what comes to mind for me is that they'll take someone like Thomas Jefferson and just say he owns slaves. And that's the one thing that he is known for. Now, right. was he morally incorrect for holding slaves? Yes. But that is not the whole story of Thomas Jefferson. And that understanding understanding of Thomas Jefferson does not take into consideration the uh, context of the time. Yeah, exactly. That's what comes to mind for me anyway. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect example. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of felt like America culturally was being thrown out, you know, uh, like a baby with the bathwater. What, what's that expression? I um, think that's it. Yeah. So the American traditional was like a a fun way to like revisit American culture and celebrate American culture and see the, you know, the benefit that it brought, but also the uniqueness of American culture. And, you know, whether that's through style or um, like moments in history or American figures who changed the world, you know, I wanted to celebrate that and not let, um, not let all of that really rich history get, just get tarnished and thrown out. Mm. So I guess that probably answers both questions there. So that deals with the American, but it also deals with the traditional, I believe. Is that yeah. I understand? Yeah. And you're I, trying to keep alive the Amer in a small way. You're trying to keep alive the American tradition such as it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And what is your conception of the American tradition? What is it that you find so unique and worthy of celebration about America? A, a conviction for individual liberty, right? I feel like most, um, most notable things about America and you know, Americans are the, their commitment to individual liberty um to like the pursuit of freedom not to the realization of freedom for every individual you know I, I don't think that that has been accomplished or i don't think that that was even accomplished at the conception of america but just that commitment to individual freedom and to have that enumerated in in a constitution that had never happened before in the world right and that you know is still the uh, how do I say that enumeration of individual freedom has still been the anchor for almost every type of progress that has happened throughout American history, right? If I would say uh, history more broadly. Yeah, for sure. That too. Um, the, the recognition of the sovereignty of the individual and the extension as far as possible of liberties to the individual has been behind almost all historical progress, modern historical progress, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So that, to me, that's the through line of what's special about American traditions or what should be preserved and what should be celebrated is that commitment to individual freedom. Mm. In what ways do you see this also being denigrated if you will if we're gonna make uh, it spicy yeah i mean i feel like i'm like flooded in daily uh issues and scandals and all kinds of stuff popping off in the news there's any day i feel like you could open a newspaper and point to 
so many areas where individual freedoms are demonized or um, uh, there's probably no better way to say it than that. What do you think is motivating it? The demonization of individual liberty oh. in favor of perhaps we might say, if you want to go here, group identity. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a mixed bag. It's everything. I feel like there are very good intentioned actors and organizations that really want to strive for, um, you know, community benefit. I also think there are bad actors that want to seize on an opportunity, you know, to, to meet their ends. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have one, one answer for that. I don't know that there necessarily is one answer for, <laughs> for that. Yeah. It's a pretty complicated question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So another thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, we'll get to your style in a little bit, but I wanted to talk a bit about your experience traveling and I want to get a sense of what it is or how it is rather that your traveling has informed your own personal unique style, because that is one of the things that is very distinctive about your Instagram page as well. Not only do you have like pictures of historical figures and moments, not only do you have shots of your own outfits and acquisitions, but you also include photographs from your travels, which I find to be fascinating. And in general, that eclectic mix is it's very engrossing for a viewer. But how do you think it is that traveling has informed your style, if at all? Oh man, I feel like every time I travel, it changes me in some way. Um, every place that I visit, it kind of exposes me to the culture there. Um, and depending on that experience, I either I feel like I adopt a piece of that when I leave and come back or um, I'm trying to think of a, a few trips recently, like I went to, to Paris in 2019, and that was the first time I had um, been to Europe. And just being there um, and kind of feeling the character of that culture and seeing the, the, the culture there, seeing the people, you know, you would sit in a, like a Parisian cafe outside in like a late morning and it's kind of cloudy and raining and you see people walking by with you know a bag and a baguette hanging out of it um but then you get to see their clothes and you get to see their style and their way of life and it affects you and it changes you and you know from my my trip to paris i came back with like an affinity for like that uh like french ivy chic kind of style um but i think traveling and experiencing it in person obviously is so much so much better than to, you know, if I were to only have, you know, picked up an issue of like L'Etiquette and learned about, you know, French menswear through a magazine, two totally different outcomes, two totally different ways of experiencing um, like a, uh, how do you say, like the style of a place. Um, yeah, is that kind of what you're, what you're driving at? A little bit. Yeah. I'm just trying to get a sense of like, uh, how it informed your own style. So you said in this particular case, you're talking about your experience in Paris, you said the kind of, would you say French Ivy style? So yeah. talk a little bit about that. Like, what, what do you mean by French Ivy style and in what unique ways did you incorporate that into your own expression of style? Yeah. Um, so I would, I would see a lot of uh, a lot of guys over there who obviously were like inspired by Ivy League style, right? Like you could pick up a issue of um, or like the the Take Ivy book, and they were obviously, you know, doing their own thing with that. But they would have these really cool um, like herringbone uh, Mac coats and like colorful sweaters. But then they would have your like regular uh, chinos with white socks and black penny loafers. And just how they combined it, if you took the pieces separately and looked at them, they're very 
traditional and one might say American traditional. Um, penny loafers, chinos, Ivy League sweater and a tweed coat. But the way that they put it together and their like use of colors, there's like a, a very distinct chic to that style. And so that informed, you know, kind of like what I started to enjoy when I came back. You know, I would um, I would try and emulate that. And it changed me in a, from visiting and seeing that firsthand, that changed the way I kind of saw Ivy League style and what you could do with Ivy League, you know. I think there's a tendency with Ivy League style for it to get a little stuffy and maybe too period accurate. You better not be wearing those trousers with pleats. Those pleats, man. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember where I saw. I don't know if I was on style form or somewhere, but there was somebody who was just so elitist about the ivy style and just despised pleats trousers with pleats it was i was just cracking up it was so funny Dogma. yeah so that's one thing that i would say that i appreciate most about your style i think you have terrific casual chic that's how i would describe it sweet Thanks. you do a particular particularly great job of using sweaters as you are here today um you're one of the people, one of the, I don't know if this is a, a designation that you would use upon yourself, but you're one of the few enthusiasts who kind of influenced me to be a little less strict, I suppose. Nice. Um, I'd really gotten into a rut with my dressing and that I was just doing the sport coat, dress shirt, tie, tie uh -huh. rise trousers, loafers, whatever combination. And it just became very, very dry and boring to me. And I just realized like, I'm going to go hang out with my friends and we're going to watch a UFC pay-per-view event. I'm not going to go dressed in that. So <laughs> how do I go dressed? And so I ended up in this kind of bizarre world where when I would go to work, I would be dressed up. I don't know what the correct word, dressed up all the way. I was going to say suited up, but I wasn't wearing a suit, you know? And then I would go hang out with friends and I didn't have anything casual to wear, or at least I didn't have a conception of how to make what I had more casual. And yeah. I think you were kind of looking at the way that you were putting together combinations was very instrumental in learning how like to just wear high rise trousers with a shirt, you know, or some high rise yeah. jeans with a shirt. And it's like, I started to be through you started to be really aware, like uh, I could still dress in a classic, so to speak manner, but also be casual, not and not be like so casual that I'm wearing like basketball shorts and a shirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, but do you, do you think that that in particular, your experience there in Paris is what informed that, your use of sweaters in your style, if you will? Yeah, big time, big time. It's also like New York City is a really cool place to, uh, just kind of observe people, right? I, I learn a lot just from watch people watching on my commutes. There's a lot of international people here and they all bring elements of their style from wherever they're from. So you get to see like a huge litany of different types of style and just, you know, a five minute walk. So I'm kind of constantly like observing and finding things that I like and adopting things and trying stuff out. Um, but like you said, too, I went through that probably not too long ago. I always wanted to do the sport coat and I always wanted to do, you know, the shirt with the trousers and the loafers and da, 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 da. But there, every occasion that I was going to kind of didn't make sense to wear that when no one else is wearing that, you know. So that process that you just talked about, I go through it too. I think that that's like the, the men's wear, like cul-de-sac, right? You, you come in the cul-de-sac and you get really into the suits and the sport coats and the, the whole shebang. And then you eventually have to kind of come back out to a more like happy medium. Yeah, I like that men's wear cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think what I was going to ask about is one of your kind of recent acquisitions. And I wanted to get a sense of like how it's, if at all, changed your style. So you bought a pair of, 
I hope I say this correctly. Cast Atlantic. Is that the oh, correct yeah. name of the brand? I Cast Atlantic. You bought a pair of their trousers, which I had honestly, I had heard of them. I had been eyeing some of their trousers, but I never got up the courage to, so courage, so to speak, to actually purchase a pair. Um, mm -hmm. In your blog, you're reflecting on how they were, they had a higher rise and a much wider leg than you were used to. And um, it was really funny as I was reading it, but it like uh, made every, every other pair of your trousers like feel too slim. Yep. And I was just laughing because just last night I was trying on a pair of uh, Spear McKay's high rise chinos. And this and is after this whole week. They? Huh? They're too slim, aren't they? <laughs> this is after the whole week I've been wearing those goddamn high rise <laughs> Andrew trousers. And I'm like, yeah, can I wear these anymore? And I just like, I kept trying them on because I have like three or four pairs of them. And I was like, I can wear them. But now they feel really, really awkward and weird. Yeah. Yeah. So what has your experience been like wearing those, those trousers? Uh, I try to resist the urge to have all of my pants fit like that, right? Now that I've worn those and I got them, you know, altered and they fit great. It's like, all right, that's the, that's the shape. The for standard. Andrew. Yeah, that's the standard for every pair of my pants going forward. Um, yeah, and I feel like half of my wardrobe, wearing those and getting comfortable in those makes me feel like half of my wardrobe is way too small or way too slim and tight. Um, so I'm just trying to find like the, the happy medium for that. Because obviously I don't think every pair of my trousers should fit like those Cass Atlantic pairs. They're very distinct. Um, they're very vintage but yeah, uh, I, I feel like half of my stuff, I need to like redo it. Yeah, that's, that's how I'm feeling right now. And there's a certain amount of anguish that comes with that. And this isn't the first time that this has happened to me, but yeah. it's like you, we'll get, you, put, you put something on and you're like, this is a lot. I love how this looks on me. I love how this fits. And then you're like, but my whole wardrobe is the other thing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. am I supposed to burn half my fucking wardrobe right now or sell it all on eBay? So yeah. I've tried to, I've tried to like calm myself down and just realize, like, as you're saying here, like you can have trousers that fit different ways. You don't necessarily need to have all your trousers fit exactly the same way. Relax. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you stick to like, if you keep proportions into consideration, I think that that's a good guide for, you know, buying clothes for the rest of your life. Like if you develop like an awareness about what looks good on my frame, what kind of proportions look good on my frame, you know, what are the, how much, what's the ratio of like uh, him to waist to shoulder, that looks good that will you know kind of navigate the the trends as decades go by i think if you're considering that stuff you'll be fine like it yeah as far as like reaching those points where you hate your wardrobe and none of it looks good or it's not the the ideal that you have in your mind anymore you know those principles of proportion are timeless so yeah let that be your guide yeah i think too it's just like um <clears throat> you have to kind of figure out how to like mix and match it. Right. Because mm. if I'm going to, if I'm, if I'm going to wear a pair of high rise chinos that are significantly slimmer than other pairs of high rise trousers that I have, that is going to a certain extent it limit what I can wear on top. Right. So you don't want to wear, it it'd probably be better for me to wear a slimmer shirt as opposed to a more roomy shirt in that yeah. circumstance, because I think this is what you're speaking to the poor, the proportions will be off. So yeah, I've had to really try to uh, force myself into that frame of mind. So I don't, you know, throw them in a barrel and light them aflame. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think the most important thing to remember is nobody freaking cares. Like nobody cares what you're wearing quite like you do. Yeah, right. particularly for people who are enthusiasts, right? Like nobody probably thinks about clothing as much as we do. Yeah, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs>
So just have fun and, you know, keep yourself in check. I feel like that's what spouses can really serve someone well with, um, you know. Spouses? Yeah, like my wife, totally. Oh. My, wife keeps me, my wife keeps me aware of when I'm like maybe getting too fixated on something. Yeah, I, uh, I guess my girlfriend does do that. Yeah. Not a spouse. When you said spouse, I thought you were talking about like a brand or a magazine or a blog. I was like, I haven't heard of this <laughs> spouse. <laughs> no, but, um, significant others. Uh, I think it's kind of like, maybe it's different in your relationship with your wife, but with my girlfriend, it's kind of like, I've reached just a point of like obsession with style and she's not very interested in style where she's just kind of like, I'm going to defer to you. Like whatever looks good. So I don't have a, I don't have, at least in my girlfriend, I don't have a good check on my insanity, if you will. Gotcha. Gotcha. My, my OCD concerning style. Good, uh, my wife has really good taste. So sometimes I kind of rely on her opinion, maybe too much. Mm. You know, I trust her opinion. And I'm, I always kind of seek her advice. That's interesting. How has that uh, influenced how you dress? Can you give like an example? Uh, you, you know, you know, when you go bowling and they put those bumpers in the gutters. Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh, maybe you shouldn't wear those trousers. They're a little bit too roomy for your frame, that kind of thing. Or yeah. Or like, like dude, we're going to the grocery store. Why are you, <laughs> why are you picking out a sport coat? <laughs> Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, my girlfriend did do that in the beginning. I think I've just gotten better at dressing where I understand context a bit better. And I've also increased kind of the more casual side of my wardrobe. But I yeah. remember one time we were we were going out to eat at a place here in California. It's called uh, it's called the Firehouse. But it's basically like a, I want to say a bar and grill, but without the grill. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't know if they necessarily grill at this particular place. But, you know, most people are going there. It's very, very casual. And I would go there with a sport coat and a, you know, dress shirt and a tie. And like, looking back on that, I'm just like, like ashamed of my, ashamed of myself. She's like, at the time, she's just kind of like, why are you wearing that? We're just going to the firehouse. It's like, because I'm a pimp. I'm going to wear yeah, whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> I set the tone. All right. What I is... run shit. <laughs> I there should have listened a, to her. I would have been a, <laughs> I would have been better off listening to her. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. At some point too, it's like, why not? Why can't you wear a sport coat to a, a bar and grill? You know, why is, why is the issue that I'm wearing a sport coat? Why isn't it that you're not wearing a sport coat? Yeah. If you get lost in that frame of mind, it could kind of be a little bit too much too, which is probably one of the rails that your spouse provides for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I don't take her advice and I'm like, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can get kind of like lost in that headspace where you're like, well, I don't give a shit what anybody else is wearing. I am the standard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I am the main character in my own movie. <laughs> yeah. Starting to feel a little bit like the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we're closing in on an hour. I kind of wanted to ask you, as our kind of like last question here, where Real do you quick. see your style headed in the near future? Like, how do you think it's going to be either changed or if you will, I don't know if this even makes sense to say this, but improved. I feel like you can only accumulate like so much and so much different kinds of things. Um, and I don't see myself leaving New York City, so I don't need to adopt like a new new pieces for a different climate, right? Um, I would love to just kind of simplify stuff. Definitely trend more on the roomier side of, you know, trouser shirts, sport coats, kind of embrace like a larger or a little bit more room to move. Um, yeah, yeah, I think overall, I would just like simplify things get a little bit more room in, in pieces and, you know, it's super cliche, but really just try to buy less and buy better. I hate even saying that cause it's so annoying. Um, but yeah, just try and take more time in between 
things that I buy and put more thought into it. I feel like I'm also learning what I like more. So I don't have as much of a urge to buy all, all these different kinds of like pieces. Um, yeah, I still love the, like the mid-century silhouettes and the, the high-waisted trousers. I feel like I like the way that that looks on me and I like it feels normal and it feels natural. I know it doesn't look like normal or natural to the average Joe. Um, they just think it makes you look like an old man. Yeah, they're like, what? what is this? <laughs> so my girlfriend says, it just yeah. make you look like an old man. You know what, though? I think that those people are a bunch of ageists. <laughs> What's wrong with looking like an old man? We should cancel them. We should cancel them. <laughs> Maybe they figured out something that, you know, young kids haven't. Do you ever see a point where your wardrobe is going to be complete? Where you feel as if you're not going to be consistently anyway, like buying clothes? No. <laughs> I think that that's a fallacy. I think uh, the human condition and how quickly we get accustomed to things and how much we seek novelty, how much we seek new experiences. Also, like how many really quality designers and makers are you know putting out really beautiful stuff i'll never not want something i'll never feel like okay i'm set i can uh you know stop worrying about this forever i don't think that that exists yeah i suspect that i'm the same way i'm too too flawed i guess um i was talking to heinrich wall Wilberg, excuse me, I was going to say Wahlberg. And he, he said at one point in our conversation that uh, he feels like there is going to be an end, so to speak, to his wardrobe and that he's going to acquire a certain amount of items and he's going to acquire it not only in the sense that he's going to have it, but he's going to understand in, in what way he has incorporated the clothes into his wardrobe. Like he understands how, for example, a Western shirt, how he can wear a Western shirt in a way that's kind of like unique, so to speak, to him. He had this like real philosophical, profound idea of like acquiring clothing, making it like part of his like being in the world, if you will. And I was like, man, this sounds beautiful and magical and utopian. And yeah. I suspect that I'm never going to be that person, but perhaps he can he seems to understand clothing and men's wear a whole lot better than I do. So, you know, maybe he's onto something that, that I'm not. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that you, you hit the nail on the head and it sounds kind of utopian. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I would love to like chat with him about that. That's, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. I guess what I should do one of these times. And I think that I was thinking in particular, about this with you and Demetrios. It would be interesting to bring both of you on at the same time and then let's have like a conversation about like cinema and the relationship between cinema and clothing. I think you and him in particular, maybe with me not even being there, just being kind of like the go-between, I think you guys would have a fascinating conversation given your love and history with film and acting. That would be, that would be cool, man. Yeah. That would be super cool. Yeah. Well, anyways, I'm going to let you get going and uh, I'm going to get going as well. Thank you very much for coming on. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Uh, for those who don't already know who you are, can you tell us where it is that we can find you? Yes. You can find me on the gram uh, at the American traditional. Um, I also do monthly digests for the brand uncommon man. So go read those. There's a new one each month. There are kind of a, uh, a cultural, um, digestible uh, email. Uh, there's all, also, they're also on the site. They come out each month and they kind of, um, you know, they touch on art, they touch on film, they touch on style, all the things that we kind of tend to enjoy together and gravitate towards. Um, and that's yeah. on the Uncommon Man website, right? Yep. Yep. So go check that out. And that's it. Uh, you also have your own website, don't you? Yeah, I have my own site. Um, I don't do enough on there. Um, I try to keep 
try to keep everything on the on the Insta these days, but that's uh, theamericantraditional.com. Maybe I'll I'll start putting some more planning and effort into that soon. Well, once again, thank you very much. Appreciate it, brother.